16. And um, and that's where that's when he started writing his book then. And I think it took him about four years. And it was published in 2009, 2020. Um, and in between that time, he had that debate with Rob Skeeper at the Flat Earth Conference. But he was a little bit um, T-boned because he he had a set of rules and Rob Skeeper didn't adhere to those rules, even though I was barricading for Rob because I'm a flat earther. But Rob brought his laptop and produced all the information on the laptop, whereas uh, Robert was coming as um, a like proper debate, everything in, held in memory. And I don't know if you uh, if you watched that, but at the end, um, Robert Sunyana says, "Well, you know, this is not the way I do it. I don't, you know, if I had have had the opportunity to bring um, information electronically, it would have been a different debate." Right. But, I remember but, seeing yeah. like the beginning of it, and he's like, "What? You brought electronics or something like that?" <laughs> and now yeah. I know why, because you just explained his background. I got you now. Right. Yeah. Because he, you know, he's been debating for years, um, evolutionists, um, PhDs in ast uh, astrophysics and um, other religious leaders. Like, as far as debating goes, he's brilliant. So I'm guessing um, um, he, he does his homework. And I don't know if you've seen um, the um, interview he did with uh, Witsit the other week, probably about a month ago. Um, it was a good conversation, but he 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 was just treating Witsit like a little kid. <laughs> like Witsit was just regurgitating all that shit, and and Robert was just treating him like a little kid. You know, tapping him on the head. Yeah, that's good, well done. Um, but to get him to debate someone like QE or Nathan, it would have to be a strict set of rules where. Um, it would have to be traditional debating rules. And I don't think Nathan or QE, no disrespect to them, I don't think they can do that. All right. If you know what I mean. Well, it's, you're probably saying, because it's like a different kind of way of doing it, right? And if they're not a different format, uh, a format of debate, maybe like a one minute here, one minute there. I don't know. Things can be challenged and you can't butt in. Who knows? So the whole idea of intellectual debates, which goes back to, so in the early days, intellectual debates come about um, we, predominantly in science and in uh, and in health. So I don't know if you remember back to, you know, um, Beauchamp versus Pasteur all in those days. So those those debates were like purely intellectual where the person would come already with citations and evidence in their mind. And they would sit down for five or 10 minutes and they would listen to the other person and they would have to take mental notes. Then they would challenge the person on their rebuttal with their mental notes, no written notes. And that was that was the whole idea of having intellectual debate. So intellectuals talking about intellectual stuff rather than, um, you know, nowadays we, you know, produce a lot of, uh, Second and uh, you know uh, uh, tertiary it, a lot of um, secondary and tertiary information electronically. Yeah, well, what's wrong with that? Though? What's wrong with that? There's there's nothing wrong with it, but that like there's nothing wrong with it, the way we do it now. But traditional debatists see that as cheating. Uh, I think I think that pe people that look at it like that, which I do understand, I think is looked on more as a sport. They look at that sport. We're trying to get to the bottom of something. We're we're looking for a fact, but I understand what you're saying though. In that type of debate, I don't know if it's more intellectual. It probably depends more on the person disseminating the information, how good he is at articulating it. Uh, yeah, I don't think those people are looking for facts. I think those people are looking to win a debate. Well, I think when it comes to memory and stuff like that, Satan. I mean, <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> that's Satan. What the? <laughs> I said Nathan. <laughs> Nathan is pretty good at memorizing that stuff. Like he he regurgitates that stuff. He regurgitates and, and that's where, stuff that's where I think that's where I think Nathan would be great because he's got a a, a really uh, keen ear uh, to listen to a particular uh, misinformation, um, but it's just whether or not he can 
um, hold on to that and note it mentally so when he, it's time for his rebuttal, he can bring it back out rather than jumping on the person when they say it initially. And that's the difference in debating traditionally to compared to debating, you know, in this social media format. All right. Oh, well, interesting new insight you brought there. That was good. Anyways, who's around? Yeah, Nathan and crew and everybody's here now. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. Anybody else got anything they want to add? Because I want to get back to cooking. I heard somebody joined G, G plus or whatever it's called. Anybody there? No. Did you say you're getting back to cooking? Yeah, I want to turn the oven fan on so it might like make noise so I can't keep my mic open the whole time. What are you cooking? Uh, just breakfast, eggs, bacon, cheese. All mixed together. I got the cheese melting on top now. <laughs> a bit of onions, a pinch of garlic. Nice. And then milk, bread, you know. <laughs> Additional bread, you could say. Where's the sriracha sauce? It's actually uh, going to be in high demand because of a certain jalapeno, right? I hear about that. That sriracha sauce is going to be scarce now. You can Google sriracha. There's a few stories on it. There's the missing ingredients that there's a scarcity of. So either they're going to shoot up in price or they're not going to make it this year or something. But, sorry, just explain that further. Let me Google some titles real quick. Sriracha. Let me see if I know how to spell it. Yeah, uh, sriracha sauce fragrance. Uh, fans are buying pricey sriracha on eBay. There's a shortage coming in the U.S. and it's something about climate change. Yeah, there's going to be a shortage of sriracha sauce. Well, good thing us Mexicans use Valentina sauce. So because of climate change, I can't buy my spicy sauce. Yep, they say people have gone to buying it on eBay. Spicy sauce? What's that? You wouldn't know nothing about that. Uh, excuse me. My wife is Guyanese. I know way more about spicy food than you, my friend. Highly doubt it. See, you're Mexican. You use like stuff hot. Hold on, hold on. You use exactly. like stuff hot. Okay? Guyanese and Trinidad, they like their stuff spicy. Got it? Big difference. Spicy and hot, same thing. No. You ever have Dave's Insanity Sauce or the bomb? Those are just hot. Yeah, Guyanese that's have spicy thing. stuff. Oh, it's very interesting. I'm still thinking about that, actually. Yeah, you know, maybe I should watch that uh, thing between Skiba and Sun Genesis. I never really watched it fully. It looked pretty long. 
but I did love the principal. I thought that movie was really fantastic. I seen it. Of course, I seen it after I came on the scene, right? Because that movie was big. Everybody was talking about it. Even uh, what's his name? Uh, um, the guy from Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's friend. Uh, oh, he he sidekick. Yeah, let's just call him a sidekick. <laughs> He even quoted him, right? And he mentioned him on, on Joe Rogan. He's like, yeah, this movie, The Principal, and all these guys, you know, they're all saying this stuff, and, you know, the stars are like shelves or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And it was interesting, right? After I checked it out, I'm like, oh, wow. So, so all this, go on. I was just going to say, but so there was a, a fledgling... Um, flat Earth uh, discussion. There was fledgling Flat Earth discussion groups back. So I remember back in two thousand eight, nine, and ten. Um, you know, in the old you know internet chat. And it wasn't until that movie, The Principle, exposed um, heliocentric principles as being false and erroneous. It, it was after that movie that the whole Flat Earth movement exploded. So I, I would put it down to that movie giving Flat Earthers the ability to be able to challenge the status quo. Oh, I never, I never thought about it like that. <laughs> that that makes sense. That could have been something that tipped it off, right? Got the ball rolling, so to say. Okay, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. From there, 2012, 2013, um, it, it really started to rocket um, and then sort of crescendo to end of 2014. And then after that, it just exploded. Hey, I am recording, however, I don't know for how long, whether or not the live stream goes ahead today, I don't know. Um, if anybody's ever used a graphics card and tried to overclock it, you'll know what I'm about to talk about. So my screens are showing flashing, and uh, yesterday when it did this, my wife was watching Netflix and it did it, and I was like, oh, I wonder how bad it's messed up. So I thought, I'll just load a game and see what happens. So I loaded the game, and it was just uh, just, just so broken. <laughs> so I thought, I'll get, get a picture of this. So I took a picture of it being broken. And then the game started with all these weird lines going all over the place and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I definitely picked the right component to replace because it's dying. The graphics card is actually dying. And the reason I bring it up is because today I got in the post um, all of the parts to replace it. Now, to replace it, it has to have a different block. Like with a water-cooled system, this is basically the same, but it just doesn't have water in it, if you imagine it like that. So it's got a water-cooled block to put a stripped graphics card onto it. Now, the old graphics card, which is more powerful, which is why it's getting changed, than the one that's going in as a replacement, has got no thermal dissipation on it. No heat sinks, nothing. It's just attached to the block. So nothing's getting cooled on it. So as a consequence of that, it's died within eight months of, of ownership, which is just awful. Now, <laughs> when we were, Craig and I, the guys, PC guy was stripping it and I was like well surely we're going to put some VRM on it you know some heat sinks on it and he's like well it's it's not had any on any on ever there's, there's, there aren't any on it so well, no because we couldn't get the replacement to fit he's like I'm going to have to use the broken one to get you back to do a show so I'm like oh well that's bad news but here we are with the broken one still functioning but with it constantly getting worse <laughs> like so just just before I piped up I'm like Oh no, the screen started flashing again and then the uh, NVIDIA overlay disappeared and then came back as it flashed again. I'm like, this is so broken. <laughs> it's unreal. Um, but fortunately, like I say, all the parts have come. We're hopefully going to get it done tomorrow and Thursday. Again, preemptively, if you're watching this as a member, because it is recording, it's actually still working. Um, yeah, that's why there won't be a show tomorrow or maybe even Thursday. We'll see. Just so you know in advance. All right, but yeah, I, I I only know what the flaws are from you know every graphics card I've ever owned I've overclocked, 
you know you try and get the most performance out of it that for me is normal um but when you push it too far the effects that you see are the same effects i'm getting now <laughs> you know what i mean not that my my graphics card's far from overclocked in fact quite the reverse i've turned i've turned it back to stock which is probably why it's giving me so many problems um i'm like i've just given up i'm, I'm like no i'm not going to spend any more time turning the voltage down and turning the power limits down and making sure it's on a nice voltage curve to frequency no no i'm not going to do any of it i'm not going to spend hours and hours and hours doing it um but as a consequence it's like every show i do i'm like oh my god <laughs> this is gonna die halfway through <laughs> I do feel a lot happier. I'd rather deal with it during the show. And if it falls over, it falls over, right? You guys know, hopefully, we'll be back in business come Friday, if that is the case today. Okay. So, Are you making excuses Tuesday? already, Nathan? No, not at all. I've got a guardian angel that's, that's supported me to get this fixed. And I'm so glad that that person's who they are, that they've helped me. Because if it, if, if it wasn't, I'd just have to deal with this now. In other words, there's no way I'd tolerate this. I'd just be like, I can't do a show like this. There's a good chance it'll crash. That that would be foolish of me. But now everybody knows that the computer's getting fixed in the next couple of days. If it does, everyone's going to be like, oh, whatever. He'll be back in, you know, he'll be sorting out. It, whereas if nothing was in place, everyone would be like, what's going to happen? Does that mean the end of the show? Because it's because it's died, like literally died? Because it did... The reason I took it in about a week ago was because it wouldn't turn back on. I don't know if you remember, it crashed, and I just I called you on Skype and just said, it won't come back on. <laughs> it's died. Yes, I do remember. Well, that's why it originally went in, you know, and all new graphics cards were ordered because I watched the deterioration and suspected, I didn't know, but I suspected it was the graphics card. So we got one ordered, and I was like, well, it might be the CPU, let's get one of them ordered as well. Um, but we didn't, you know. Either way, the point is, like I say, I'm just sitting in front of a dying graphics card knowing from past experience what graphics cards do when they've got too much voltage or they're unhappy or they're dying. You know, I know what I know what the symptoms are. But I said to my wife last night, even though I've been saying it, the graphics card's dying, when you absolutely 100% confirm that that's the case, you can finally stand by and go, shit, PC builder, what a joke. You didn't put any heat sinks on any of the VRM or memory or anything that dis that needs heat dissipation. It was just bare. You're like, uh, what a crappy, what a crap. I'm not going to even name the company. I feel like doing it, though. I feel like naming and shaming them. But what a disgrace. You know, to send out something that's pulling th almost 300 watts and has got no heat sinks on it or anywhere. Like, well, that's just a joke. No wonder it died. Anyway. Well, it's it's a testament to the show. Because people are gutted when there's no show, me being one of them. And it's just a testament to this show. Hats off. Sure. Yeah, I like the fact that people are so supportive that they, when things go wrong, they want to help financially, where I simply couldn't do it. You know, I was having an hiring earlier about buying a, a little plate. I want to buy a, a lapping plate so that I can lap this. The, every time the CPU comes off that cooler, there's a massive area in the middle of the chip that hasn't got any thermal paste on it which means it's not making contact with the plate. So I want to lap it. I just, I've decided that's it. I'm, it's worth the risk at, uh, at eight or nine months old. It's not brand new. It's not going to be like you're telling me you took a brand new 600 pound part and rubbed it against sandpaper. Yeah. And now it's broken. Yeah. Well, that was stupid. Yes, it was. But eight months in with stuff failing while you're taking stuff out and jiggering it around, you're like, no, it's worth the risk at this point. If it does fail and I've got to replace it with the... 450 pound replacement with almost the same part you're like well that's so be it because to suffer the overheating when there's been this much got work gone into it, it's like if i go the extra mile order a lapping plate and all the correct grit of sandpaper which i've already got um then with the help of my pc guy i can lap the cpu which is a reasonably common practice in you know overclocking and again this, this is so i can turn the power right down <laughs> you know i'm not overclocking anything um but that's something that they do in overclocking to get the temperatures down when they're pushing the chips harder and harder and harder well for me i just want it to cool properly and work at about 140 watts of 250 that it's specced for um so about you know half approximately um well once it's cooling itself at 140 watts i'll be delighted because i won't it won't ever need changing for five or six years There's, i don't i doubt there'll be many changes to the show to demand more power 
but the power it currently requires is 140 watts from the CPU, and it just it throttles a bit. Now, is that really a big deal? No, but if it was attached to the cooler properly, for all I know, I could probably get 170 watts out of it. It'd be blisteringly fast. Now, I'm not going to moan about the fact that it's not as fast as it could be. That's not a big concern. But not cooling itself on a really hot day, that is a concern. So lapping it might get it to be cooled properly for, for <laughs> once in eight months, um, while the whole thing's being stripped anyway, which it will be tomorrow. Um, now I've got all the parts. Like I say, the reason, again, I'm talking about this is because it was so, like, not heart-stopping, but when I opened the bag of bits for the replacement GPU, I'm like, wow, this bag is full of little tiny heat sinks for all the little tiny components on the GPU. So they've all got little sticky back pads. And the, the idea is you peel off a whole row of heat sinks, stick it on the VRM um, so that the whole thing's populated where it would typically be attached to a cooler and some fans. Well, there isn't any. So where it's situated, there are no fans. There might be some that I've put in the top and bottom of the case, but they're nowhere near it. So what it needs is anything that's going to have heat you know, produced has to have it synced to another piece of metal so that the air can take it away rather than it just sitting there boiling. But there we go. That's what was a stark, really obvious to me when I opened the bag. Like, wow, there is a lot of components that are going to go into making a, a GPU circuit board air-cooled, like with no with no fans. The, that's the idea. Yes, I do have some. Um, but if you look at the old one, there's nothing on it. It's just a bare, it's just a bare board. Nothing on it. You're like... Uh, no wonder this bloody failed. Anyway, I've probably said that twice now, so I'll shut up. Still recording? Yes, we are. Nathan, can I ask a question about your setup? Sure. Uh, so you're just running a passive cooling at the moment, correct? No, it's got six fans in it. Yes, it's a yes you... and no. I'm being facetious. Yes, the computer is specifically designed to be passive. Yes. No, I haven't left it that way. I've hooked up fans to it because <laughs> it won't cool. So where it should have zero fans, zero noise, it's got six fans and is noisier than my last PC that wasn't specifically designed to be passive or quiet. But there we go. Such is life. <laughs> it sits in a room. So do you measure the ambient temperature of that room while you're running the computer? I don't. I've never measured the ambient temperature of the room, but... I'm reasonably familiar with how hot a room is from being in temperature-controlled environments for a lot of my professional life. So when a room is of a given temperature, I can generally tell how hot it is. So, for instance, the other day when it was summer here, my kids' room does have a thermometer in it, and their room, which is cooler than this room with a 1,000-watt projector and 3,000 watts of amps and a 1,000-watt PC all cooking the room with all the windows closed so there's no noise, all sealed up, this room in a general hot day, can reach 40 degrees. Blisteringly hot, to the point where sweat's pouring off me. And <laughs> I remember watching a podcastage video. So podcastage talks about um, microphones mostly. And he's got a podcast as well. Talks about this and that. Anyway, his in his microphone videos, he's, he's talking about noise in the background, specifically fan noise from computers. And moreover, fans that will keep you cool. So he's explaining you need to find a balance where you can't hear the fans, but it's keeping the computer cool. It seems obvious. But also, the fan for you, you don't need that fan. If you've got a mic in the room, the mic will hear the fan. So just turn it off. Now, the obvious question at that point is, well, what about you getting hot? The answer to that question is, what about it? <laughs> Your audience wants the best quality of sound to come through their ear holes. They don't care... That you're hot. There you go. That's as much as I can give you. The room gets blistering though, yeah. Therefore, the PC overheats because of the ambient temperature. Yeah. So, the, you can't have a headset and microphone because you're obviously looking after the kids most of the time. Is that correct? And I don't want to. Like any good engineer, headphones are evil. So, yes, I could use headphones. Yes, I have used headphones. Yes, I do occasionally use headphones. However... Having a proper monitoring system in a acoustically treated room, it, 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 there is no comparison. The, the clarity of what I can hear from my guests is just unsurpassed. Further to that, what I'm hearing is accurate. In other words, this is what it sounds like. It doesn't matter where I listen to. I listened to my show in the car today because I was doing some editing. 
and it didn't matter that it was coming through some tinny horrible speakers that what i heard when i mastered it if you will now live is the same as what i get through an ipad or through the car it's a consistent sound but that's because i'm doing it in a certain environment that i've developed and spent a lot of money to achieve that you know i want to hear what you specifically sound like when you're talking to me so i can make little adjustments and therefore match everything as close as i can so that when it reaches the ear holes of the audience it's of a roughly comparable level uh, a roughly comparable dynamic range for each of the guests little things like that but you've got to really be able to hear without without a sweaty pair of earphones on i imagine <laughs> it would it wouldn't help me i'd still have the projector and the pc running just not the amps if i had headphones on right it's it, it would just mean i'd have water pouring out my ears <laughs> you know and it wouldn't necessarily be to my advantage i don't know i just want to be comfortable especially if i'm debating um you know you want to feel as com physically as comfortable as you can be i've got my feet up quite literally